It is now time for our, our uh, visiting feature reader, and we are very jazzed about Surrey writer Christina Myers joining us for the online of Anybody Words on Fire, Jackie Cal Michael says. Myers is the creator and editor of Big Stories About Life and Plus Size Bodies from Caitlin Press 2020, a collection of nonfiction by 26 writers from across Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The book made the BC bestseller list shortly after it was released in February of this year. She's an amazing writer, and the remarkable new anthology she has pulled together features great writing of writers from around Canada and beyond. Myers is an alumnus of the Writers Studio at Simon Fraser University, a member of the Federation of BC Writers, and she juggles stay at home parenthood and her creative work from behind her desk in Surrey, BC. And she is here to join us tonight. Christina. Uh, hi, I think I've, I've clicked something wrong there. Did I, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. You can, yes. okay. I thought I clicked the wrong button there for a minute. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, thank you to the organizers and everybody involved and, and who has come out tonight and for inviting me. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, I was gonna be coming out in August for an in-person reading and I was really excited to do that. I haven't been over to Port Alberni in a long, long time and was really looking forward to making a big uh, trip of it. But uh, the upshot, we get to do this. Um, we only have to look fancy from the waist up. It doesn't matter what we're wearing from the waist down and we can be very comfortable and, and, and just go straight to bed when we're done. So um, we'll take the positives for what they are. Um, in the introduction, um, he told you a little bit about the book. Uh, it would be lovely to assume that everybody knows everything about your own book, and then I wish I could could pretend that, but instead I'll tell you a little bit about it, because I know most people haven't necessarily heard about it. So this is the book. Um, it is an anthology. It was published by Caitlin Press, which I'm sure most of you know about them. They publish all sorts of great books here in BC and across Canada um, on all sorts of topics. Um, there's 26 writers in it. Um, I uh, made the book and edited it and, and created it and it's sort of my my little book baby. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do tonight, if it's okay, I'm going to read um, two sections from the book, a little bit from the introduction and then a little bit from uh, my story in it. I pondered whether or not to read different sections from different writers um, because as I said, there are so many writers said for hearing those writers in their own voice. And we've been, we had all sorts of launches planned uh, that were coming up and we had to cancel all of those, but hopefully all the writers and it will have a chance at one point or another to read their own stories in their own voice. So I'm going to read a little bit from my introduction and a little bit from my own story. So we'll start there. Um, I'll just hold it up one more time so you guys can see what it looks like. It is available at independent bookstores all over the place and directly from the publisher and from major online retailers as well. Um, although I've heard that they, the major online retailers are a little bit uh, backed up because they're, they're sending out essential things before books and I think the books are probably a little more essential than the rest, but that's okay. So um, in the introduction, um, I talk a little bit about my relationship to um, my body and my relationship to the words that we use to describe uh, bodies and um, Everybody has different opinions about which words are good words and which words are not. So I'm just going to read the, the very last few paragraphs from the introduction to give you a sense of kind of what my goal was with this book. Big is a simple word with complicated implications. It is always a relative term dependent on the unspoken comparison of something that is not as big. It is in some ways the most encompassing word, the most inclusive of experiences because we can be and are big in countless different ways. In choosing it as a title for this book, it is also intended as an invitation, an open-ended word that will resonate with readers in diverse definitions. In the following pages are more than two dozen stories about being big or fat, curvy, plus size, chubby, and yes, sturdy. There's a reference earlier to me being, describing myself as sturdy. Stories that each use the same words in very different ways. Stories that share small windows into what it means to live in a certain kind of body. Stories about childhood, bullying, sex, fashion, motherhood, healthcare, relationships, bodies, self-image. Stories that are funny or full of grief or both. Stories that needed to be told and now need to be heard. In creating this book, 
I was interested in curating a diversity of opinions and ideas and memories and views. It's not my job or anyone's to tell a person how they must feel about their own body. The writers in this collection are not a homogeneous group who all feel the same way about themselves or about the culture and world that are, their bodies live in. While there are overlapping threads and common themes, these stories are, are a reflection of unique lived experiences and differing perspectives. All of these writers, however, have this in common. In sharing these stories, they are vulnerable and honest and bold and brave. I'm grateful for their passion and enthusiasm for this project. To the reader holding this book in your hand right now, or to viewers listening, I hope that these stories resonate with you in ways that are both familiar and brand new. I hope you learn something about other people and about yourself. Most of all, I hope this book makes you ask questions about the way you think and talk about your own body and other people's bodies, about the world we live in and its lessons and obsessions and about the words we use and how they shape us. So when I was collecting the submissions for this project, probably lots of you have sent in submissions for various anthologies. Um, and you, if you've participated in an anthology before, you know that there's usually a, a huge diversity of stories. And that's really the case in this book. There's stories that um, are, as I said in the introduction, stories that are funny and stories that are sad and stories that, um, you know, just are totally unexpected and, and sort of come from a, a place that you're not, uh, not even aware exists and uh, one of my goals was really to create something that people could read and at least one story in here would resonate with a reader as uh, something that they have experienced in their own lives or that they understand and that at least one story would be something brand new that they would learn from and uh, certainly as the editor of this project I learned stuff from working with these stories and working with these writers um, about lives that are very very different than my own so so that's a little bit from the introduction and now I will read a little bit from my story. So as I said, there's 26 stories in here. Um, this one, I put myself way at the back. You can see it's almost one of the last stories. Um, and my story uh, was written several years before this book came together. And in fact, it was part of the impetus that led to this book being created. Um, I had written it for a uh, liter online literary magazine. It went a little bit sort of viral. The CBC invited me in to do um, um, an audio essay version of it, a much, much shortened audio essay version of it. And then it ended up um, being in this book. So it's called The Fat Girl's Guide to Eating and Drinking. And when I wrote this, I was thinking a lot about, um, I'm not sure, it depends on sort of um, backgrounds and ages and genders, but a lot of us are familiar with, uh, you know, sort of these magazines, particularly women's magazines, but not always, that have lists about how to behave and how to act and how to do certain things and how to be ready for um, bikini season. And, you know, we're always getting lists of how to be better than we are right now. And so I was thinking a lot about that sort of thing and thinking a lot about the rules around how we exist in the world and how we uh, move among other people and what we think is acceptable and not acceptable. So that's where this came from. Um, it's a series of tips. You know, so yeah, there's eight tips. I won't read all of them. I'm going to read one from the beginning, one from the middle, and one from close to the end. It'll just give you a little sense of it without me rambling on sort of indefinitely. Tip one, salad. Always order the salad. It's the least likely to prompt direct questions like, I thought you were on a diet. Can you have that? Or passive aggressive observ observations like, oh gosh, I wish I could eat pasta, but I just feel so guilty about it after. Good for you for not worrying about such silly things. I got briefly distracted by the chat on the side there. I think I need to close it so I'm not monitoring. <laughs> Salad is safe. Salad is virtuous. Just monitor the toppings and dressings. Otherwise, someone will point out they saw an article in a magazine last month about how salads nowadays are way, way, way worse than the cheeseburger and fries. Then you've just wasted your order, opting for the virtue of a salad, but still getting heat for the cheeseburger. Go simple, host salad, no creamy dressings. Do they have a smaller version, a half order? Even if you know they don't, ask anyway, you're trying. Never forget this, if you can't be beautiful, at least try to be. Skipping ahead to tip three. Monitor your consumption. 
eat as slowly as you possibly can, talk a lot, as though you aren't starving from pretending food doesn't exist all day, as though eating is not your primary motivation to be here. When your plate is half empty, comment on how full you are, as though a regular serving of salad is just too much for you. They need to know you're not just trying to be thinner, you clearly have the constitution of a thin person. It's like a quirk of nature, the Bermuda Triangle of bodies, that somehow you don't even enjoy eating and you consume hardly anything, and yet here you are, still big, Sympathy is only a fraction better than judgment, but it's better all the same. Don't be the first one to finish, even if you ordered the smallest item. Leave something on your plate. Leave something carby on your plate. If you leave the cherry tomatoes, but you eat the bread, no one will be fooled. <laughs> Tip four, enjoy the party, just not too much. At a party, carry a glass of soda water with lemon and stand at the opposite end of the room from the food. If you find yourself within a dozen feet of the buffet, everyone will assume you're hovering. They're watching, of course. All those foods are there for people who aren't fat. Everyone knows queso and tortilla chips are a reward for being thin. You fat girls are welcome to approach the crudité platter and you may swipe the tip of the raw asparagus into the bowl of herb and garlic veggie dip. But don't double dip. That's just a disservice to all the other large ladies out there who are trying so hard to ensure that people don't think we're all a bit mess messy and slovenly and crude. Dip once. Enjoy. Eat the rest of the asparagus plain. Go back for a carrot stick. Just one. Remember, your roommate told you that carrots are super duper high in sugar, so you may as well eat a donut as have a bowl of carrots. After the carrots, switch to celery. If absolutely necessary, have a few mushrooms. They're mostly water. Do you drink enough water? Looks like you might be retaining. Drink more. <laughs> Tip seven, reconsider your thighs. When lying in bed on a random Saturday morning, before you are awake enough to have felt your hunger and then berated yourself for being hungry at all, notice unexpectedly as you roll onto your side and the light from the window glows warm over your skin, that the shape of your hip is like the curve of a long golden sand dune. Run the palm of your hand over it from your waist to your thigh. It's so strong and soft, the smoothest skin anywhere on your body. Then catch your reflection randomly in the bathroom window. Sorry, the bathroom mirror, the window at Starbucks the rear view of your car, and suddenly, without intention, notice how the roundness of your cheeks makes your face electric and excited when you smile. See how the fullness of your breasts is like the heavy weight of fruit that's ready to be picked, solid and lovely in the hand, delicious. Discover how the slope of your shoulder is dusty with freckles like constellations. Notice that your legs, your strong legs, so strong from carrying you so well all these years, are neither girly nor mannish, but simply yours. Go to a restaurant with friends and order a salad because actually you happen to love the salad and it's what you wanted, not because you wanted to apologize for eating. Order the salad and eat the whole thing because you were hungry enough or eat half of it because you weren't. Then realize you didn't tell anyone when you last ate and you didn't spend half the meal talking so it wouldn't look like your food wasn't important. So it would look like your food wasn't important. Your food is important. It fills your golden sand dune hips and your electric excited smile and your starry constellation shoulders and your strong, strong legs. Reconsider your thighs. Reconsider everything. Tip eight, feed yourself. Breathe, close your eyes, Sink into your body rather than letting it float away from you, detached like a balloon on a string, separate and foreign. Hear what it's saying to you. Feel what it needs. Trust yourself. Trust yourself again for the first time in a long time. For the first time that you can remember, maybe. Feed yourself like your hunger is not a sin, like your body is not a crime, like you do not need to explain. Feed yourself like a celebration. Fill up on good food and the kindness and forgiveness it implies. Feed yourself like you have not spent a lifetime crafting rules to make yourself belong, to make your existence permissible, to make yourself beautiful, even a little bit. Discover at last that you already belong to yourself. Discover. 
one of my little phone alarms went off there. Terrible timing. All right. Discover at last that you already belong to yourself. Discover finally that you did not need permission to exist. You exist regardless of approval. Discover at the end, which is now the beginning, that you are already beautiful, not just a little bit, but in ways that are magic and endless and cannot ever be measured. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. You know what we do here at Words on Fire is we turn the floor over to the audience for questions and answers. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm up to, if anybody has a question, I'm open to that. What made you write this book? What, what, what inspired you to write this kind of a book? Um, so I had been writing a lot of creative nonfiction. I come from a newspaper background. I had, I had written as a newspaper reporter for years. And I, part of that was I always had columns of various kinds that were sort of either comic or, or vulnerable and revealing. And so I was accustomed to writing about my own life. And over the years, I started writing a lot about sort of my body and, and how that sort of changed how I interacted with the world. And um, I had a few unconnected, dis disconnected pieces. And then I had written this and, and it sort of did quite well and people had heard about it. And um, I thought, well, gosh, this looks like the start of like an essay collection. Um, I'm going to pitch this to somebody. So I put together the essays that I had and sent it off. And, and um, thank goodness, you know, to their Credit. Caitlin Press said, yeah, we're interested in that. That sounds good. And I started uh, working on the remaining essays. So I had pitched it as a partial, partially completed concept um, and said, here's what I have and here's what the rest would look like. And as I was working through the rest of the stories and writing them, I, it really started to slow down. I was getting really bogged down in it and they would come back and say, you know, how's it going? Is, it, is the rest of the manuscript done? And I finally had to sort of acknowledge that it wasn't coming together. And um, at first, I thought that the reason was because uh, that it was too vulnerable. It was too much honesty. It was too much of my own life kind of going out there. And especially when you're talking about bodies, I don't know um, how many of you are sort of on Twitter, but you can be really <laughs> like some social media platforms, you can get really heavily trolled for talking about these kinds of things. And I thought, oh, I'm just nervous. I'm nervous to put this much out into the world. Um, and then eventually I realized it wasn't that I was nervous. The reason that the rest of the pieces weren't coming together was because they were fundamentally all from the same um, perspective. Uh, you know, I'm a 40 something blonde, suburban, 2.5 kids, um, heterosexual, you know, pretty kind of middle of the road background. Um, and I really increasingly was starting to realize that um, it needed more voices. When I had been into the CBC to do the radio version of this story, um, the person that I was working with was this tall, beautiful uh, woman. Uh, I can't recall her background, but a woman of color. And as we were discussing the book, and we were talking about how we both had kids that were young you know, and how we wanted to pass on good messages to them. And I said something like, well, there's nothing worse that a woman can do in life than be fat. Like you can really, you know, that's really the worst thing. You can sort of fail at your job. You can, um, you know, all sorts of things that you can do sideways. But if you're, if you're fat, that's like the, the worst badge of shame. And as I was looking at her and I thought, this is this, I'm a white woman saying this to her. And I thought, well, no, wait a minute. Um, probably the worst thing you can do is be fat and a woman of color or fat and a woman of color and queer. And, and over time, that conversation and me working on the stories, I really realized that um, those intersections were all really important and really necessary. And that did anybody need to read 10 stories about um, what it's like for a white woman in, in the suburbs to be fat? Maybe we needed stories about what it's like to be um, black and queer and fat. And maybe we needed stories about um, being fat and then losing a ton of weight and what that is like. And we needed stories about surgery and we needed stories about uh, diets and failed diets. And um, you know, one of the stories in here is about um, somebody putting on a pair of Spanx and the Spanx fall down in the middle of their, of their meal. Right. So uh -oh. there's all these stories about different things. And so I went back to the publisher and I said, I, I think that this story, this book needs to be broader. It needs to be more expansive. It needs to include way more voices than just my own. And they said, Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Like, what would that look like? And so I sort of repitched it as what that would look like. And thank God I did. Um, I think it came together so well and I got to, 
meet some amazing writers. Most of the writers are in Canada. I think there's two in the US and one in the UK, but most in Canada. Um, and they're just all amazing people and have very different perspectives. I mean, some of them would describe themselves as fat activists. Some of them would describe themselves as, you know, we have someone in this book who had um, stomach stapling surgery and, and talks about what that's like preparing for that. So it's all these really different perspectives. And um, yes, that was a very long answer to the question of what, what inspired me to do it was really thinking about my own life and then realizing that my own life is a very small sliver of a really big topic and a really timely current sort of topic. So, so yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> well, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Bruce here. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good, uh, well, kind of an experienced teaching aid type of thing uh, on uh, large people, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, that's from listening to you. Personal stories actually make it much more realistic to the reader, and uh, they can be an emotional reflection on themselves and the story that they're trying to tell. But I've found, uh, you know, the world, the Western world especially, is maybe headed for a major problem with large people. I, mm. I, I yeah, no, myself I, for a while. And, uh, yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't disagree with that. And that's one of the topics that comes up uh, when the, with this book. You know, people say, are you, are you glorifying something here? Are you sort of, right? Um, I, I think we could talk about... Um, big bodies and fat bodies for a hundred years and and it's never going to be something that's glorified nobody is going to read this book and go that sounds fantastic i'm going to go <laughs> and, and gain a hundred pounds right yeah. um but the reality is that when we look at sort of the statistics the damage that happens around diet culture where people yeah. are yo-yo dieting getting into disordered eating um i'd love to say i was immune to that i wasn't i've been you know i look at pictures of myself as a teenager and of course i was quite small i wasn't really that big but i thought i was what kind of disordered eating patterns arose out of those cultural messages and multiply me by millions of people particularly yeah. young women um, and the health impacts of um, anorexia, bulimia, you know, disorder, all of these things far outweigh um, the health impacts of people being heavy. So I think what my approach is in that, and I agree with you, it's a thing that comes up in, in relation to this topic, is to say to people, um, one, we can't, we can't know how to work with people until we know more about where they're coming from. Um, and, and everybody has all sorts of different reasons why they get to where they get to. Um, you know, Roxane Gay, um, incredible, amazing, famous writer, she wrote the book Hunger. And in that book, she talks about how she started to gain weight um, in response to being raped when she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have this really clear cultural message that weight is um, a personal failing, moral failing, all of these other things, right? And there's usually so many more keys and pieces that go into it. So part of my motivation was saying, let's, let's talk about this and talk about the different places that people are coming from, because then we can um, meet people where they are versus insisting here's the box that you need to be in. Yeah. And um, the reality is that we also have a lot of um, misconceptions about um, people based on their bodies. Um, like I work out way more than most of my girlfriends probably do. I'm in the gym all the time. I lift weights. I, I, well, I'm always attempting to jog, but I hate jogging. So I revert to walking, but people might look at me and go, Oh, you must be lazy. Oh, you must eat all the time. You never work out. Um, but you know, I could probably arm wrestle an average man and, and beat him at that because I'm quite strong. Um, so part of my motivation too, is that is like these assumptions that we make about people based on their bodies um, that, aren't always accurate but yeah you know I think this uh, this notion that we might accidentally glorify obesity or enable it by talking about it I think we could talk about this for 100 years and and still yeah nobody would ever go like oh that sounds glorious let's let's do that you know we're not going to convince people to um, not be concerned about that I think people always will be concerned about it but if we can be inclusive and welcome them in and say that these stories are valid and, and that your life experiences are valid then we open the door to a lot better conversations i think so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll tell you what, if you ever do a volume two, I got a heck of a story for you. <laughs> I, it would be amazing to do volume two. That would be great. We had so many stories that I couldn't, couldn't put them all in one. So yeah, someday. Oh. Fingers crossed. We have to have more than that. We have to have two and three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stories. Any yeah. other questions? Just one. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Just um, the uh, Christine, Christina, the way you presented. Um, there's a rhythm to the way you speak and to your writing, and so it really. Uh, it really works in terms of spoken word. It really works in terms of um, having a, a platform to uh, be out there uh, and and talking and expressing and being poetic. Thank uh, you. And so it's it's quite lovely. But you know, is is that also how you uh, present your work? Is that also a, a platform? Is that also another way that you present what you do or in your writing? Uh, is the question, do I also do sort of spoken, spoken word? It, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I, <laughs> I, I secretly, in fact, as I was, as I was waiting for things to get started, I had my little secret um, book of poetry. <laughs> I've never written or published poetry and, um, performing in any capacity is very, extremely intimidating for me even this has me like I'm in I'm in sweat so um uh no I, I would love to do more like that and and that just made my day to hear you say that uh, because I it's hard to self-evaluate how you sound online and um I write mostly fiction and non-fiction I have a, a novel coming out next year um and my um public reading is always sort of wing it and hope that I <laughs> hope that I survive so thank you for saying that and maybe it'll give me the encouragement to yeah. um because my the poetry that I do secretly write even though I never share it is is much more sort of a, a spoken word kind of type stuff but I haven't gotten up the yeah. courage to share any of it so maybe I will next time <laughs> yes well the work that you presented tonight certainly there was a kind of rhythm that um it penetrated and thank so you. there's something thank about you. that. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I, that you can actually follow Christina. And uh, she, she starts a lot of very fun conversations on Facebook. And <laughs> she does things like she tries out those superhuman new pantyhose or, or, <laughs> or, oh, scary. or weird false eyelashes. <laughs> like she has products. And she's, she's bold enough and brave enough to like do front of people and it's so <laughs> the writing is very funny oh so, thank you oh, upon I, like my question, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, for my story if you do a, a volume two uh, it, it's from a, a medical perspective of uh, you know been being fat and obese for a long time and then all of a sudden with a disease like Crohn's Mm. I, in the span of just over a year, I lost 110 pounds, wow. and I went three, over 300 to 180 pounds. And uh, well, I've got the weight back on now, so uh, I don't know if you have a story like that in your book, but I can tell you that that's my yeah. story, and uh, it, it's a horror, harrowing one, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. That's the other thing um, that actually does come up in a few of the stories is people who. Oh um, who have lost weight because of some other thing that's going on and how um, how our bodies look trump everything else. So um, that people would be in grief, dealing with something like Crohn's, um, dealing with depression, dealing with all sorts of things, and people would encounter them. And instead of saying like, you know, we make the assumption that weight loss is good. So probably you experienced that with, with your situation where people would, you know, just looking and go, oh, fantastic! Oh, you look great! Oh, fantastic! And we never stop to think, well, maybe that's not fantastic. Maybe there's other things going on here. Um, 
I have two kids. My, my oldest is about to turn 13, but when he was born, I had postpartum depression with him. I'd never experienced any kind of depression or anxiety. I couldn't even figure out how to make a sandwich, let alone eat it. Like I was that um, sort of messed up. And people consistently were telling me, you look so great. Wow. You look, so, oh, you've lost all the baby weight. It's so great. And I desperately wanted to scream at somebody and say, I'm going crazy inside my head. I can't, there's something really wrong with me, but all people saw was the weight. And that does come up in several of the stories where people um, are dealing with some kind of illness or some kind of secondary thing. Um, but people just assume, and this actually happened to me recently, about a year ago, I lost um, about 20 pounds very quickly. I was going through a period of really extreme grief over something that was going on. I wasn't eating properly. I wasn't sleeping properly. And I kept encountering people who were like, oh, fantastic. That's so great for you. And I thought, my life just got turned upside down over the last few weeks. This is not fantastic. This is not a good thing that's going on, right? But we make that assumption when we look at people. And really what it comes down to is that we shouldn't be commenting on other people's bodies, even if we think it's a good compliment. If it's a good compliment to us, doesn't mean it's good to somebody else. We should just be keeping our noses out of other people's bodies. Um, and, you know, we, we, but we, we think we're being helpful and we think we're being complimentary. I've done it a million times myself. I've bumped into a friend and gosh, oh gosh, you look great. You, you know, you've lost this weight, but that does, yeah, that kind of experience, I think really speaks to the fact that we make assumptions about thin equals good and, mm -hmm. and intentional and fat equals bad and right. And we don't stop to think about what are the pieces that are going into that person's lives at that particular moment. So, um, yeah, that is several of the stories touch on that exact thing of sort of inadvertent weight loss related to mental health or physical health or, or illnesses. Um, but that that's just invisible, right. That all people see is what their body looks like. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Are there questions for Jack Jackman? Is everyone on mute? Jacqueline, yeah, I have one. Jacqueline, how did you come up with that children's story to do with COVID? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was really um, doing a lot of binge watching TV and feeling kind of scared and useless and um, thinking about my body and how at a time of COVID-19 when they're saying it's getting to the obese people first and thinking, well, crap. So I was, I was pretty, um, I was pretty upset with the world. And then I realized, Hey, I'm a writer. I should be doing something. And I love telling stories to my granddaughter. I loved telling stories to my children. And I thought, how are parents getting an opportunity to talk to how are they talking kids are hearing a lot of noise about this covid stuff they're being told to do weird things um and it it's it's probably freaking some of them out um i know kids are super resilient that's really great but i think that it is um it's important that we help our little people not feel too anxious and let them know the adults are worrying about this the government is worrying about it. the adults are worrying about it you just kind of do your best you can and and um then i thought well animals could help me tell the story so i tried to make it not too alarming a little bit comforting a little reassuring and just help help them know that somebody else is worrying about the things so they don't have to worry and uh, i was that's what i was hoping to do and i really wanted to do it and just have it available as a free ebook and that anybody in the world could download and read to their kids if they were worried about that or i just that's what i was thinking I'm going to do a print version now so that um, so that I can actually give copies away to people. Uh, it's hard for uh, to have an ebook for kids. I think it's better to have a print version. So so that's what I'm going to do. Awesome. I just want uh, okay. just want parents to have that tool in their toolkit. And I try to be really inclusive. So there's there's all different kinds of families. It's not just uh, you know a mom and a dad and 2.5 kids. Although congratulations on the 0.5, Christina. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm messing with you there, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I really tried to make it so that there was all kinds of configurations. There was kids who had guardians, there was big families, there was only kids, there was moms in charge, there was dads in charge, there was two women who were looking after kids, you know, I, I just tried to, um, and actually my sharpest editor, in addition to um, Derek uh, Hanabury, was my own granddaughter because I was reading this to her and showing her the pictures using Zoom, of course. 
and I accidentally used all the, I said all the people instead of all the animals. And her in her little six-year-old brain, she went, oh, people! And I was like, man, you're gonna be an editor when you grow up, girl. So that was, that was super fun, but um, yeah. So, the more editors, awesome. the more it succeeds. Thank you, good question. Anybody else? That's great, thank you very much. What a, what a thrill to hang out with you guys. And uh, seriously, thank you for listening to a kid's story. That was very big of you. We all need that once in a while. Uh, yeah, just ditto, Jackie, just to say thank you, everybody, so much for listening and wonderful questions and, and just for having me. It's, um, yeah, it's lovely to be able to visit, minus the ferry, and, and hopefully I'll be able to visit for real <laughs> once we're all doing that sort of thing again. So. Well, I think, I think everyone's posted their web links for their books. Did I see that in the chat? Yes, you have. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I don't have a web link for my, my books, unfortunately. You have to contact me through Facebook directly. Uh, I'm still a lot like, sorry, Jackie. <laughs> so we can either um, start the break or we can just continue on. Does it, is, if anyone would like to chat right now, we can have open chat or. Open, open chat for 10 minutes. Or... Yeah, I think 10 minutes might be, I think yeah. we've already chatted. Or I can see Colleen shaking your nodding. <laughs> yeah, so we can get up and stand and stretch. <laughs> yeah. Is the chat available after the video? Like, can you? Uh, uh, you can click on save chat yourself. Oh, okay. I, I, have, I will have it on my um, recording, but I haven't figured out how to publicize it. But yet. I could but save I the chat. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm just gonna look. I know you can, and I. You can, if you go just down where it's the, where you're, if you're gonna chat to somebody, it says save chat. That's where you can save it. Yeah, it's somewhere here. Yeah. So just type in your message. There's three dots, and that's where you can save the chat. Yeah. 